Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations in each one of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, for you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. Almost 20 years ago, I spent one whole summer working for an organization that put me going back and forth along the U.S.-Mexico border between, between Tijuana and San Diego. I was working with church youth groups to show some of the realities of life along the U.S. border. My home base for the summer was a small rural orphanage and olive farm. It was called Rancho El, Mil Rancho El Milagro, Miracle Ranch. The founders of it were moved by the plight of orphans who lived on the streets in Mexico City and Tijuana, and they decided to dedicate their lives to creating a home, a family for these kids. The orphanage was located on an olive farm, and the business model was for the olive harvest to play for, pay for the operations. But of course, there was always a shortfall. Money was always tight, and the directors were always fundraising to keep the place going. When I was there that summer, the director, Cesar, told me a story that has always stuck with me about money and fundraising. A very wealthy person heard about Rancho El, Mil Rancho El Milagro and came down to visit one day. Having spent almost no time there, the potential donor met with Cesar and offered a very significant financial contribution. I don't remember the dollar amounts, but I recall Cesar saying it was the kind of gift that would be very hard to turn down. But he did. He turned it down. Instead of accepting the check, Cesar invited the man to spend a week living at the orphanage, far from any major city center, dusty and very impoverished, beans every day. It was a place that was also full of love. Cesar invited this man to get to know the kids, become interested in the daily rhythms of life on the ranch, and see what happened. He told him, I don't want your money. I want your heart. The gospel lesson we heard today is one that can be hard to hear. I know I almost cut about two-thirds of it because we have a long worship service, and I thought, Gosh, all this stuff, you got to explain a lot of context to really do justice to this. And I'm not going to explain all the context. Um, you can Google some Bible studies on your own, though, if you're interested, or come to the weekly Bible studies where we hash all these things out. I do want to say any time that divorce comes up in Scripture, I am aware that it can be particularly hard to hear because we are a church with many people who have undergone divorce. And I hope that you all know that the teachings on divorce have really changed, and one of the things that is, um, underscores what Jesus is doing here is he's actually, he's actually doing something radical that doesn't sound radical to us, but in his time, he's actually giving some protection to a woman in the case of divorce that wasn't in play before. So he's actually modeling that divorce changes and how we understand divorce changes over time. Anyway, all to say, I have seen people undergo divorces and it was the best possible thing for their lives. And if you are one of those people, please do not hear this text as a judgment on your life. This is a hard gospel lesson to hear. Jesus is telling his followers that as they embark on the life of discipleship, they will need to hold themselves and one another to some very high standards. They aren't supposed to just do away with the religious laws and norms that gave them identity and community in the past. No, they are to fulfill them, to do better, and then some. They're to have such integrity that they're, not, they're able not only to control their outward actions, but also their inward being. It's not good enough just not to kill. You're supposed to not even get angry. It's not good enough to avoid adultery you're supposed to not even think of another person that way. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Do what you need to do to be right all the way through. I don't think Jesus would be pleased for us all to walk out of worship today missing arms or eyeballs, literally or metaphorically speaking. And this is one of the places where almost certainly Jesus is talking in metaphor 
I have heard no record of any disciples of Jesus actually chopping off their own limbs, at least in Jesus' time, because it caused them to sin. But I do think he's speaking in such extreme measures because he wants us, like his disciples originally, to take their life seriously and to realize that the life that God invites us to by following Jesus isn't just some surface level change. Being committed to God is a commitment that touches your entire life, inside and out. It's hard stuff. It requires you to have some discipline. I mean, you all know this because you all got to church this morning. And I'm positive there are other things you could have done with your time. And so I'm nearly positive that you know the blessing of the disciplined life of faith that as you create intentionally ways for you to connect with God and each other, blessing comes. That's the kind of thing that Jesus is getting at here, that you need to put your life with God in the center of your life, not as some peripheral thing, but right at the heart, and let everything else fall into place. I imagine it's along the lines of someone who is running for office. Has anybody here ever run for office? I wouldn't doubt it. Ah, okay, I knew at least somebody had. Um, I'm betting if you're considering running for office, you better know you shouldn't have skeletons in your closet, right? And if you do, you should just know they're going to come out, that you're going to be scrutinized and held to a higher standard. I think that's a similar thing that Jesus is saying to his disciples that people are watching you and that the character of our community and of your relationship with God requires that you pay attention to how you act in the world. You have a higher standard. You can't just write a check. You can't just tick a box. The life of discipleship is total commitment, a transformation, and it works on every level. This might sound like some really high expectations, and it is. Indeed, Jesus says that the, act, the consequences of your actions are serious. But that's true, isn't it? We know what happens to unchecked anger and how it can ruin families and churches and communities. We know what happens if adultery just runs rampant through communities how destructive it can be for people. We know what happens if people are making all sorts of promises that they can't keep and trying to curry favor with people, making their yes, no, and their no, yes, working two sides of an angle, and how hard that can be. Jesus gives us these expectations, I think knowing full well that we can't live up to these standards, but trusting us that when we orient our lives around God's grace, everything else will look different. It's helpful to remember that when Jesus says all this to his disciples, none of them follow through, not perfectly. It's not to let us off the hook, but to drive us to remember that on this Commitment Sunday, what we remember first and foremost is that God's commitment to us is the most important thing and the thing that cannot be broken. And in response to that, we commit to, we say, yes, God, we want to give you everything that we have, not just our check, not just 10%, although that's nice, but everything, all of our relationships, all of our life, it's all for God. Soon we will be invited to give our financial pledges. We're going to do this again next week because somehow in the press of everything that was happening last week, it kind of got lost in the shuffle. And I always know if I'm surprised that something is happening, other people probably are too. In fact, Pledge Sunday so crept up on me that I am not prepared to offer my pledge today. I usually like to be the one that leads the pledging along with the council and the stewardship team. But my husband and I have simply not had the time and the space to sit down and pray and think thoughtfully about how we will give, and we like to do that. So if you're not ready to pledge today, 
you get a chance to do it again next week or even in the weeks to come. But if you are ready, I invite you to realize that this pledge that you give to the church, it's one way to support the church, but it's also just a piece of the whole fabric of your lives that you give not only to church, but to God. Back at the ranch, Rancho El Mil I can't, I don't know why I can't say that word today. Rancho El Milagro. You can guess how the story ends, right? The donor spent a week with the kids, and he was so moved by his time there that he became a regular volunteer. He committed far more money, but he also committed time and energy, and he developed other people's relationship with the place. He stayed up nights wondering how the kids were doing. He became part of their family, and they became part of his. And that's what God wants from us. It's not about our money. It's about our heart. Amen.